So I'll begin. Good evening to uh, you all. On behalf of Centro Primo Levi, the Italian Cultural Institute, NYU Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimo, and the Vidal Sassou International Center for the Study of Antisemitism, I welcome you. And we're here to present Valentina Pisanti's book, The Guardians of Memory and the Rise of the Xenophobic Right. It was published by CPL Editions and translated by Alastair McEwan with a preface by Michael Rothberg. The translation was awarded a special prize of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs that helped make it possible. So thank you all for being here. I'll say a few words of uh, um, Cento Primo Levi's involvement with this book. We decided to publish it in English. And the question, the question he raises is whether there may be a connection Sorry, I have to disconnect here. Perhaps a, a causal connection between this institutionalization of memory and the new rise of xenophobia. That is, um, that this very memorialization purports to prevent. Um, this is not the usual call to action against the boys of anti-Semitism, denial and racism, but a call to self-analysis addressed to the very institutions that like ours, like uh, universities, like museums, like educational organizations are responsible for the narration and display of the past in the public sphere. What attracted us to this book at the when we which first was submitted to us, was that it offers a photograph, a photograph of the status and role of the memory of the Holocaust in our society, a photograph that shows that this memory is an enabler of consensus over some practices that are equally at odds with democracy and the principles of intellectual inquiry. Historians of the Holocaust in Italy, which has long been left at the periphery of international historiography and has been a testing ground for all sorts of political activities, are especially familiar with this dilemma, which has been a constant challenge for Centro Primo Levi. My hope is that this book will help mobilize a much needed reckoning and an honest and rational conversation on each of the issues Valentina addresses. We will begin with the presentation of the, uh, of the author, followed by Michael Rothberg, and then by our two historians on duty, Manuela Consoni and Omer Bertov, who will respond. There will be Q&A, and please send questions, and only questions, through the Q&A box. And for all other communications, feel free to use the chat box. I'd like to add a, a, a last note. Um, the scholars who are here today are very important and their work has been very important in the activity of Centro Primo Levi. And um, I'd like to thank them publicly on behalf of our small team and our public. I will leave the screen to Paolo Barlera, director of the Italian Cultural Institute, who has been our partner in this endeavor. Thank you all for being here and good listening. Thank you, Natalia. Um, a very warm uh, greetings from the Italian Cultural Institute of New York. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to collaborate with uh, Centro Primo Levi and the other Italian institutions in New York, uh, and especially today, um, because we have a very large audience and a very international uh, panel to discuss this book. Uh, I want just to mention very briefly two things. Uh, the first one is that um, it seems a very uh, timely and appropriate um, that uh, to present this book because it's been, uh, as we were saying, a couple of weeks ago and, and for the, the Day of Remembrance, it's been 20 years that um, um, uh, the Italian government and institutions and especially uh, the institutions in New York have been commemorating this event. And it's time to reflect upon what uh, has been done and what is the meaning of, of this commemoration. And the second thing is that uh, it's more uh, about the Institute um, uh, in this time of uh, the, uh, 
pandemic and difficulties, uh, it has become increasingly more important for us not only to showcase uh, uh, products that were already um, uh, done and, and made by others, but also to uh, uh, participate in the production of, of new products. And that's why we are very happy and, and honored to be, have been able to participate in the production of this English translation of, of Valentina's book. Um, that's all I have to say, and uh, I leave the floor to Valentina, I believe, or Natalia again, I don't know. Thank you Yes, again. to Valentina. And, okay. Thank you, Valentina, for your book, and uh, please okay, take so the screen or the stage. Thank you, and first of all, let me thank you, Natalia, and Alessandro, and Primo Levi, editions for hosting the event and also obviously Valentina sorry if I apologies if I interrupt you would you be able to come a little closer to your microphone yes can you hear me now it's a little better okay so I was saying thank you for publishing the book and for hosting the event and I'm very grateful to everybody I'm very grateful to Michael Rothberg for his wonderful preface and to Manuela and Omar Bartov for being here and so, and for everybody else's presence here today. Now, I, I suppose I should say something about how this book came out, what the, what, what it came, what the idea was. It's the outcome of a research that I have been conducting for say about 20 odd years now. It started in the late 1990s with my PhD dissertation in semiotics, because I am not a historian, I'm a semiologist in Holocaust denial, the subject was that. And Umberto Eco was my supervisor. And I remember at the time he told me something to the effect of, but don't bother arguing that Holocaust deniers are obnoxious liars. We know that already. Your question needs to be, is there method in their madness? And the answer was, yes, there is. It's obviously a twisted, a paranoid logic which is based on the systematic abuse of historiographic evidence, including survivor testimony. But it is a method nonetheless. And whoever wants to combat Holocaust denial or other similar aberrations needs to understand how this logic actually works. And as well as the denier's logic, we have to understand their rhetoric and the cultural setting in which it takes root, it, it has taken root since the Forisson affair, Robert Forisson, the French denier, who in 1978 is probably at the origin of the big bang of the phenomenon of Holocaust denial. Well, since then, Holocaust deniers have learned how to harness their adversaries' moves to push their anti-Semitic agenda. And they've also learned how to usurp the role of martyrs of free speech uh, whenever their provocations spark off a mediatic storm very predictably. So this got me thinking about the deep interactions between memory culture and anti-Semitic discourse. Because negationism is like a cog in a larger cultural mechanism that is made up of other discursive devices, if you want such as, for example, trivialization or the sacralization of uh, memory. And each device triggers the others, like the, like the wheels in a gear train, even when these wheels rotate in opposite direction. Well, following the publication of my dissertation, I got directly involved in some of the rituals of memory culture, and I took part in them, uh, especially around Remembrance Days. And I must say that uh, uh, Michael Rothberg is perfectly right when in the preface uh, he suggests that I too, like him, am a guardian of memory. I too, I'm a part, I'm implicated in the phenomenon that I'm trying to deconstruct. And I too, I, I, it's not just that, I'm also a beneficiary of that same system that I criticize as my presence today amply demonstrates. So this is what made this book particularly difficult to, to write. So who are these guardians of memory? Uh, they are, I should say, eminent spokespeople, spokespersons. They are organizations, they are 
associations, etc., who speak on behalf of the victims, who manage the appropriate commemorative practices, who identify and sanction the abuses of memory, and who establish who else, apart from the victim's direct descendants, has a right to appropriate the categories of Holocaust remembrance and to translate their own claims in the vocabulary of that narrative, which by now has become the hegemonic, culturally hegemonic narrative. So the guardians are appointed or sometimes self-appointed uh, keepers of a sacred space, a sacred symbolic space that confers an aura of charisma, of moral stature, and sometimes even of preemptive immunity to whoever is admitted inside that space. Even when those admitted are ultra-nationalists or sometimes overtly racist political leaders who, for instance, visit Yad Vashem or other memorial sites to undergo a sort of uh, cleansing process, cleansing ritual, which is indispensable if they want to attain uh, positions of political responsibility. In the light of all this and other considerations, in the last few years, I started thinking about the contradiction between the explicit goals of memory politics on the one hand, i.e. the fight against racism and anti-Semitism, and the outcome of 20 to 30 years of intense commemorations all over the Western world. And what is the combined result of all these efforts, of our efforts? Well, it's hard not to notice. It's a widespread upsurge of intolerance, of racist violence in those very countries in which the politics of memory are implemented with the most vigor, most vigorously. So obviously the question now is, is this a natural, uh, is this an inevitable outcome of, uh, of the politics of memory, or is it something that would have happened anyway? Is it something that could have happened even without, or would have happened even without the shield of Holocaust memory, or perhaps, which is my hypothesis, is it legitimate to wonder whether something has gone badly wrong in memory politics? And there are many, many ways in which uh, racist movements and parties hijack the standardized formats of Holocaust memory to their own advantage. And I can't list them all, but these include, for example, the ways in which victim-centered narratives have been systematically emptied of their historical content and adapted to a variety of different agendas, including anti-Semitic ones. Uh, but the victim-centered narrative has also been turned on its head lately to promote a survivorship mo model that celebrates other values, the values of resilience, of self-affirmation, self-preservation, and even unbridled competition between individuals and groups while cloaking all the partisan claims under the veil of universality, universal values. Now, how many of these right-wing mutations, if you want to call them like this, but actually hiding in the folds of memory culture. This is, I realize, very tricky terrain. My idea, my hypothesis, is that in the last few decades, since at least since the fall of the Berlin Wall, when Holocaust memory has become the master narrative of triumphant liberal democracies, a large part of memory politics has taken a subtly authoritarian turn. And this is quite evident, for example, in the field of memory laws, in the European debate on memory laws, where you can obviously see a paradox, which is to promote the values of liberal democracy of which the Holocaust is the supreme symbol, legislators are quite willing to apply various forms of censorship. And notice how this paradox mirrors and is entangled with an opposite paradox on the other side of the fence. Holocaust deniers and other racist publicists appeal to the supreme value of freedom of speech to rehabilitate the ideology of those who burn books. But memory laws are just the tip of the iceberg. I believe we'll be talking about these some, some later date. The discrepancies between liberal goals and illiberal means are also present in 
less blatant forms in all fields of memory culture, in the cinema, in journalism, in political analysis, and so on. As the official spokesman of the victims, the guardians operate on the dogma of unquestionable authority. Some guardians operate on, the, uh, on that principle to decide who has the right to speak and in what terms. Notice how, for example, how many of today's cultural battles have to do with the unevenly distributed right to take the floor and to put forth one's claims. Sometimes the Guardian's decisions are open to dispute and as is demonstrated by the many diatribes that regularly explode around memory related issues. And there is also some fierce competition within the community of Guardians as to get, who gets to uh, control the formats of memory. Well, it shouldn't come as a surprise when the same principle of authority is brandished with greater historical coherence by those who promote it, who use it to promote their own particular interests by any means necessary, as they say. I don't know if I have time for one last very brief remark about the issue that we, I believe we, we, we are discussing here tonight, and that is the thorny issue of uh, the role of Holocaust testimony within this paradigm. Perhaps, I don't know, Natalia, perhaps I can talk about it later on after the other speakers have said their part. Perhaps I think it would be a good okay. topic to set us to bracket a little bit and I will, uh, um, let's leave the stage to Michael and, and uh, then we'll continue and, and we'll take back on the, on the testimony. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Valentina. Okay, thank you. I am I'm grateful to Natalia and Dreamy and Alessandro Cassan for inviting me to write a preface to the book. And in some sense, the main message I want to leave with you with today is you should you should buy this book. Um, I think it's a I think it's an important one, and I think the questions it raises are really essential for us to engage with. Um, the book, and I think you've already started to get a sense of that, is provocative and it's challenging. And I hope uh, I can rise to the occasion and be a little bit provocative as well in turn today. And the reason that it's provocative is that it addresses a problem that we all recognize or a couple of problems that we all recognize. One is the, the rise of the far right and populist movements around the world. The other is the uh, seeming failure of uh, Holocaust memory to provide a bulwark against that rise, whatever the exact relationship between those two phenomena is. So I think we all recognize that what is, what is particular to Valentina's perspective, obviously, you've already started to get a sense, is that she refuses to look for the source of the problem only in others, right? Only in our uh, political opponents, only among the extremists. Rather, the book is best understood as a form of self-criticism. Um, it is a critique of uh, a left liberal paradigm of Holocaust memory, uh, which has been promoted by various guardians of memory, as she calls them. On the one hand, people like Elie Wiesel, Claude Lanzmann, who we all recognize, institutions like the International Holocaust Remembrance Authority. And then I think also, as we've begun to discuss, people like us, right, scholars and intellectuals. The paradigm reached an international consensus after the Cold War but it has certainly failed to, um, to achieve its lofty goals, which have to do with the movement from the rhetoric of uh, never forget to never again, right? And in fact, as Valentina points out, the, the sort of failure of that ability to move from never forget to never again um, was visible at the very moment that this paradigm uh, triumphed in the early 90s. Think of 1993, 1994, Yugoslavia and Rwanda, right? So I think that Pisanti is right, that we, we can't only look for explanations among our enemies, political enemies. Of course, they have played a huge role in this as well. It's not, I think, about absolving them either. Um, we have to start closer to home. And at the heart of the problem is the particular paradigm that has triumphed in the post-Cold War moment. And it's this the, the paradigm of the victim-centered paradigm. And as I understand it, there are a few uh, linked features of this dominant paradigm. First is the, um, the valuation of the victim as a kind of absolute and unquestionable moral standpoint. 
Together with that, a second point is uh, that that victim position is uh, opposed in a very clear binary to perpetrators, to the perpetrator position. And therefore, along with that, um, uh, an opposition between a kind of absolute innocence on the one hand and an extreme evil on the other hand. Um, that uh, clear story of victims and perpetrators is then un unfolded in a kind of standardized and often sentimental narrative structure that Valentina talks about. And fourth, those narratives are become part of a, a monumentalized memory culture, which is institutionalized, is often state directed or directed by various uh, institutions and, and NGOs. So this paradigm, I think it's true, has become a kind of international consensus, but it does play out a little bit differently in different national contexts. So I wanted to pause for a moment and focus on one of those national contexts, a somewhat anomalous one um, in which we see this paradigm at work. And that is, I wanna look for a second at the German model of coming to terms with the past. Um, there is, of course, much to be lauded about this model, which took decades to emerge, but finally did produce, I think, the most developed ethical memory culture of a former perpetrator nation, certainly that I know. Um, the, 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 the German paradigm that triumphed combines an absolute commitment to the uniqueness of the Holocaust with a very clear cut and also, I think, absolutist distinction uh, between victims and perpetrators in which Jews are identified with victim, the victim group and Germans with the perpetrator group. And there's obviously a lot of plausibility to that, uh, to that model in a German context, but I think part of the issue is how well it has traveled into other contexts. But I think also it has ended up, and here's the, the point that I wanna make, producing certain kinds of perverse effects of the sort that Valentina is discussing in her in her book. And so I just wanna mention three of them really. So first, in terms of the, the conceptualization of the perpetrator in this German model, uh, Jan Grabowski, the uh, Polish Canadian historian argued recently that uh, this insistence on the Germanness of the perpetrators ends up giving a pass to collaborators in other countries such as Poland or Hungary or the Ukraine and that it therefore inadvertently feeds into a kind of historical revisionism in those places. And if we needed any more proof of that, we could think of the trial that just concluded in which Grabowski and his colleague Barbara Engelking were convicted uh, of slander for their research precisely on collaboration. A second um, dimension of this, uh, em this equation of Germanness and perpetration has to do with uh, the effects that has within German society on groups that don't, uh, can't position themselves easily in relationship to, to the perpetrator identity. I'm thinking here of various migrant groups and minority groups, including Jews, right? The model is so premised on an equation of Germanness and perpetration that if you can't, if you don't have direct lines of that sort to the perpetrators and maybe even have lines to the victims, your status as German starts to be uh, put into question. And then finally, in terms of its conception of the victim, I think its conception of Jews as absolute victims has led to a very troubling policing of critics of Israeli policy within the German sphere. And so what's happened is that despite all the statistics that show that the vast, vast majority of anti-Semitic deeds in Germany, 90% or more in most uh, accounts, are committed by the far right, those who have found themselves most visibly targeted for alleged anti-Semitism are people like Ashil Mbembe, Cameroonian intellectuals who attempt a very broad understanding of uh, forms of domination. And because of that get tarred as, as anti-Semitic or even more strangely perhaps, Israeli artists living in Germany uh, who in, in a recent case uh, attempted to create a project called Unlearning Zionism which, and were then accused themselves of being anti-Semitic. So I think there are various uh, perverse effects that we see that emerge from the, the dominant uh, paradigm of Holocaust memory in the German context and ultimately supply ammunition for right-wing governments in other places as well, like Poland and in Israel. So Pizanti's book is aimed at a critique of this paradigm and she doesn't really attempt, nor is she required to, to posit an alternative vision. Um, insofar as there's an alternative vision that you can kind of read within the, within the text itself, 
I think, and maybe when she comes back to testimony, she can say a little bit more about this. There's a critique of the sacralization of testimony. And it seems to me it's done in the name of a kind of normative historiography, but I'd like to hear her talk a little bit more about that. I have some questions about that. And then she is also, I think, looking for alternative narrative structures beyond the one that's centered on this victim perpetrator binary. But the one that she uh, discusses in the book is this kind of social, what she calls a social Darwinist plot structure of TV series like Game of Thrones or uh, The Sopranos, in which you have a kind of battle of all against all instead of these very clearly defined moral positions. And I think that's a provocative point, and I think it does capture something important about our moment, but it's obviously not an alternative that we would want to affirm, right? So I think we're still in search of alternative paradigms. And as I discuss in my, in my preface, I just wanna conclude here with two potential paths um, that we might wanna to take to go beyond this victim-centered paradigm. Um, and I wanna be clear that I don't think that we can uh, transform large institutional discursive structures like the ones that uh, Valentina is is uh, investigating in her book simply through a kind of voluntarist individual agency. But I do think as intellectual guardians of memory, we can use our positions, we can direct our energies uh, to try to construct and build new frameworks that challenge that paradigm. So what I suggest is that first, instead of the oversimplified victim perpetrator imaginary, we need to draw attention to what I call implicated subjects and implication. What I mean by implicated subjects are not perpetrators, but those who enable, perpetuate, and benefit from acts of violence and other injustices. And I think that if we, if we think about how, how those who are not direct perpetrators contribute to and participate in violence, including genocide, uh, we can expand and complicate the picture of perpetration and victimization that we find in that, in that dominant paradigm. And we can start to tell different stories about what Primo Levi called the gray zones of, of, of modern life. And here I would, I would maybe mention a film like Son of Saul, which Valentina doesn't seem to be so fond of, but I actually think is quite powerful and does offer a kind of alternative to that, to that paradigm that she's discussing. So I think that drawing attention to implication, to collaboration and complicity can help break the moralizing and sentimental dimensions of liberal memory culture. And then the second and final thing that I wanna emphasize is that I think we can highlight and seek to promote alternatives to the monumentalized and standardized dimensions of the memory paradigm. And so here I'm thinking of the kinds of grassroots memory activism that Jenny Wustenberg talks about in her book, Civil Society and Memory in Postwar Germany, another book that I really recommend. Jenny looks at the history and memorial site movements that preceded the, the post-Cold War monumentalization of the German model. So grassroots groups, grassroots groups in 80s Germany, who really in some ways are responsible for the efflorescence of, of a memory, uh, responsible memory culture in German, but preceded its institutionalization. And then I also think of the kinds of militant or insurgent memory that I explored in my book, Multidirectional Memory, especially the memory work that took place during the Algerian War of Independence, often by people who had themselves been in Nazi camps, had suffered torture under the Nazis and deportation, and then came back in, in the in 50s and 60s uh, France and were contesting the state's uh, uh, late colonial war. Today, I think we find this sort of grassroots insurgent memory work in activist projects that are seeking to decolonize cities through street renaming projects and through the dismantling of monuments to colonialism and white supremacy. Um, these projects are focused less on events about which one can say never again and more on structures that are repeated ever again. So just to conclude, I think that a memory culture worth guarding today would be a memory culture that seeks to dismantle precisely those structures of white supremacy. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Michael. And um, Manuela, if you want to, well, now the, the historians uh, will respond. And no, the, the historians <laughs> Manuela, will not but respond. We are a very old fashion, and, uh, and then Umer. Well, I, I, I read with great interest uh, the book of Valentina Pisanti, Valentina, as it seems that we, we know each other. And I would start saying that it's certainly a challenging book that will 
raise discussion and quarrels, a synthesis of culture and political turns and implosion in memory politics and political practice in the first 20 years of the 21st century, unmasking the failure to promote a more universal, more democratic discourse supported by a vigilant and critical cautions, not only at the individual level, but public level. Pisanti unveils before our eyes the point of no return we reached in discussing the memorial practice of the Shoah, the entanglement of identity politics in such practice, registering the absence of a solid and morally firm counter narrative which could challenge the current codified abuse at the service of the most obscurantist and reactionary political agenda. The two enunciation opened her book. In the last 20 years, as she said, the widespread of memory politics with commemorative activities and the parallel raising of racism, intolerance, and xenophobia that can be summarized in such. You know, the paradoxical coloration about the two is between an universalism that this moment memory wants to promote, opposed to, to difference, and racism that in a sense is opposing the difference that this universal memorial practice should on the contrary promote. The book is a macro analysis, which while uh, that aims to offer a field recording on the 20, 20, uh, 21st year of the 21st century, as I said, confronting the institutional political commemoration with relevant memorial references to specific political and cultural moment of transition that belongs to the previous century, as you mentioned before. And so she speaks about Eichmann, Wiesel, Kahana, Primo Levi, Bloch, Lejeune, Piers, and others. Her analysis offers a semiotic interpretation of historical reality and of memory, putting on the stand as accomplice, chiamata di Correo, not only the institution, uh, the association, the commemorative practice, and who, as you mentioned, in, pol in the case of political disputes, decide who has more right to express their claims in the vocabulary of the Holocaust, and I quote. In particular, I feel, or oh, I feel because I felt, she points the finger against historians and against their resignation in pursuing the truth. Pisanti call us back to our critical tax in a political and cultural context so polarized, bent on a frenetic advocacy, based on non criteria of memorial legitimacy for and against designated social groups. A question that she uh, arise from the previous statement, are these two disconnected facts, independent historical series, or is there a relationship and is our task to counter the current xenophobic way to question the reason for this paradox, perhaps more than juxtaposing them in a contradiction. The dictum famously admonishes us, who doesn't learn from memory of the past is doomed to repeat and reenact the same past. And we know that such reenactment is never about repeating the good events of the past. Pisanti, we have studied in an impressive manner her previous book on the uh, on gas chamber, on the Holocaust denier. She studied the mechanism, wonder if this failure is accidental or if there is not already inherent in the very same premises of the memorial discourse that has at its center the Jewish extermination, containing from the very beginning a flow of form, so to speak, which fueled the memorial construction and contributed to the development of racism and xenophobia. The last two aspects are not, I would not say that are an effect of bad memory, but rather of bad politics, which informed the memorial construction of the Holocaust from the 19th no onwards and was discourse in the West is currently used to legitimize government desire and not only in Europe to normalize the past in claiming myth of historical and political innocence at the cost 
of dismissing history and memory altogether. I agree completely with this anti-registration of the political reality of the last 20 years. In each of the chapters in which she points at the implication of the political and memorial drifts produced by this construction. The basic premise that the commemoration of the Shoah would have been enough to serve as a formidable antidote to all forms of totalitarianism, racism and intolerance, vesting it, as she wrote, with the missing mission of ensuring that such episode may never be repeated, it was probably a misleading assumption. Personally, having studied memory, I never trust it as a genuine depository of a universalistic project fostering human solidarity. The iconic status assumed by the witness for its absolute dimension regarding truth within historical knowledge is arbitrary to totalize an assumption about the witnessing and the process of witnessing. On testimony and on the methodological approach chosen by Pisanti to define it, I would like to conclude and I will also would say something on the role of the historian. Pisanti argument, the starting point of thought provoking discussion is testimony. The meeting point of the paradox, I would say at the root of this same paradox, or paradox of these two opposite tendencies which develop parallel in the memorial and political discourse. From testimony, she derives her entire argument. Pisanti applies the tools of semiotics to the analysis of testimony, the new testimonial fetishism, which leaves and unfolds around the figure of the witness, the new totem, to use Levi Sulan's suggestion. The semiotic of testimony plays a pivotal role in the book. It is not a simple appendix, an accessory to the other chapter, chapters, to clarify particular points not completely covered in the text. Rather, it is the backbone of her argument. And she writes, what inequivocably is testimony proof of? The only event of which testimony is per se a symptom or a trace is the mental activity of the person who gives it. In principle, there is no natural relation between a witness account and the event to which it indirectly refers, given that the first is comprised of words, symbols, par excellence constitutionally suited to lying and duplicity. And she adds that the rhetorical power of testimony lies precisely in its capacity to set itself up as evidence or index of the historical event that it represents. Beyond the several questions that she posed to the, in the opening of this chapter, I want to also ask a question about uh, this semiotic approach, I would say. And it's, it's a general question. It's not only a question to, uh, to Valentina. Is testimony eminently only a linguistic act? Is the testimonial pact signed by the parts similar to the autobiographical part as described by Lejeune? introspection on the one hand, need for truth on the other. This double movement does work for testimony. Beside being a linguistic act, testimony is a fact, is an action grounded in reality and it, it, its enunciation cannot be disentangled from reality. Beyond words, there is the tangible irreducibility of reality. They are not constitutionally unacceptable testimonies and their value must in intrinsically be ascertained by sources that can support it. It is not enough to state something in order to make the same thing true. And my concern here is, is the echo of the controversy of the Vidal Nake and Carlo Ginzburg with Aydan's Y theory, according to which this creates its own object, from which it could be inferred that historiography itself creates its own object that is history. Facts do not have only a linguistic existence in spite of both. 
and testimony is a fact. The access, evidence, truth, and history cannot be entirely dismissed. And although testimony can be false, distorted, fictive, even in this condition, they always testify for reality, as in the case that you also mentioned in the book on Wilkominski, that was a fake survivor and a fake witness, that also his testimony, neither on the grounds of words nor of reality, could be really dismissed. It is a symptom to claim the privileged place of the totem within distorted political and social practices, practices which praises and foster this condition in order to escape history and memory at the end. Its testimonial anomaly bear witness to reality. We will put in question the very existence of it and therefore the idea of, histori of, of historiography altogether. For the better of the worse, the notion of reality exists. And without it, how can we make a difference between fiction and history? And for the purpose of the discussion, since that you mentioned the, the book, on the where you dismantle the, the mechanism of Holocaust denial, I would say that the difference with testimony is that is testimony possess a factuality that is opposed to, to discursiveness of the Holocaust uh, denial statements. What I want to say. The last hour is only a discourse, only words intentionally and structurally built on the dis disentanglement from reality, from evidence and from truth. They live of the discourse that they produce, deploying a rhetoric aimed to appear authentic and historical truth. This discourse conceals a vacuous historical fraud within words. And my last point on the, and also here is, is a question, is, is the engagement with the law and with historiography that you, you did along the, the, the book. Now, law and historiography, they share methods, but they do not share at all epistemological rules. And so I would not want legal rules transfer into historical research as I would not want historiographical justicialism. And even if we wish to undo what has been done wrong, it is impossible. And therefore what uh, remain to us to do, or what I think. We should study, inquire, deconstruct, dismantle, discuss, debate over the reason, the causes, the effects, and the mechanism in history and in memory in order to counterattack and react to what history and memory became, to refuse the play God role which some historians are so willing to fulfill, using their authority to become guarantor of history and of memory, we should maybe develop a citizenship of protest in opposing, to quote Julizac, any teaching of contempt challenging ex cathedra the current hegemonic discourse because inequality, intolerance, racism, and hatred are indeed social construction. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. Thank you very much. And thank you also for quoting Julie Zak, who, who is very appropriate in this context. And now, uh, Omer, if you want to take the stage and uh, give you give us your comments and then we'll start we'll ask Man Valentina to respond a little bit and we'll open to discussion of all of you thank you uh thank you very much um thanks for inviting me and thank you for giving me the opportunity to read uh, uh beside this book uh let me put you in gallery so i can see some people here um so this is a book that, that uh, provides uh, numerous important insights and observations. I should say it resonated with me because uh, for some years now I've been teaching a graduate seminar on first person history in times of crisis uh, that covers diaries, testimonies, courtroom witnesses, memoirs, 
reel and forth, uh, fiction and film. And also because in the past, I spent a fair amount of time uh, thinking and writing on the links between World War I and World War II, the industrial killing in 1418 and the industrial murder of the Holocaust and the representations of mass death in both uh, after both World War I and the Holocaust. And so it appeared to me first uh, interesting to raise the point that the notion of never forget and never again was not invented after World War II, but in fact uh, came up very strongly in the wake of World War I. Um, and um, it, it served in many ways as a model for thinking about the same uh, notion of remembering uh, something that was very difficult to represent and certainly to prevent in the wake of World War II. Now, I, of course, like all of us, I think, recognize the urgent need for self-analysis, um, certainly of liberal uh, democratic societies in view of the rise of the new nationalism, racism, xenophobia in Europe, in the Middle East, uh, and in the United States. And the question is whether this analysis um, um, provides, uh, or this book provides uh, this analysis. Now, as we've seen, as we've heard, uh, Pisanti's main question um, or thesis is that in the last 20 years, the Shoah has been the object of widespread commemorative activities th throughout the Western world, and that in the last 20 years, racism and intolerance have increasingly, have increased dramatically in those very countries where the politics of memory have been implemented with the greatest vigor I'm, I'm, I'm citing here. Uh, and there is the question is, is there a connection between these two phenomena? And if there is, what is it? Uh, Pisanti quotes a, an Italian right-wing journalist, Vittorio Feltri, who puts it very simply, the Jews have been breaking our balls for decades with the Shoah. Uh, that's Holocaust fatigue, that's people are fed up with it. You can hear the same kind of thing in Germany uh, if you ask, especially young people. Uh, and you can even ask whether this kind of response has some similarities to the rise of political anti-Semitism in Central Europe uh, following the emancipation of the Jews in the 1870s. Um, and I think that historically there can be some, some interesting question raised here. But I would say that Pisanti's book is largely focused on an analysis of the guardians of memory and pays less analytical attention to an analysis of the return of the xenophobic right. And, and this is something that we have to grapple with. And simultaneously, my own sense is that the book does not critique as fiercely as necessary, at least as I would have liked, the abuse of uh, the Holocaust as memory and a symbol by certain guardians in the interest of their own political agendas and ends Sometimes she's actually quite gentle on them. Um, um, and one example, of course, is the curious relationship between such guardians as Benjamin Netanyahu and authoritarian regimes in Eastern Europe. Um, now, let me just touch first uh, on the context. Um, the belated rise of Holocaust awareness, and we all know that it took decades for that to actually occur, um, began in the 1980s and 90s and reached a certain real prominence in the, in the 2000s. It coincided, as has been mentioned, with the fall of communism, with the end of the Cold War, and the so-called end of history. Um, and it finally also coincided, as I think uh, Michael said earlier, with the return of genocide, both to Europe and to other parts of the world, most prominently Bosnia and Rwanda, right after the fall of communism. The rise of the radical right and, and all its various uh, aspects obviously also coincides with the fall of communism, uh, but it also has a whole other set of contexts, such as the weakening of social services by the state, the growing corruption in democracies and resentment and skepticism in the public, the growing impatience with political correctness, the process of globalization and the economic price for the lower middle classes, 
and the growing gap between the rich and the poor, minimization of upward mo mobility, a sense of being left behind, and of course, growing migration into Europe, and in the case of the United States, that sense also in the United States. That is, I would say, the emergence once more of the politics of resentment. And if you want to sort of have some echo in history, uh, such as Fritz Stern's politic of cultural despair of the pre-World War I period, I would say that that is the larger historical context uh, which we have to take into consideration. So I would propose that the general connection between the two phenomena that are um, um, pointed at by Pisanti, uh, there, there is a temporal and contextual um, relationship between them, but I'm not sure there's a clear causal relationship between them. And I think that that, that needs to be discussed further. Now, I want to touch on some specific arguments as an historian, and I, I hope that Pisanti will get back to that because she um, uh, did say that she would talk more about testimony, and Manuela already mentioned it, uh, so um, I'll uh, speak a little bit about that. Um, my, my own view of the relationship between the era of the witness and historiography is somewhat different from Pisanti's, if I understand her argument correctly. I'd say that whereas the witness is a representative of the Holocaust grew in importance in the public sphere, the use of testimony in historiography remains patchy and is still considered new, innovative and suspect, mostly for the wrong reasons. The relationship between victors and losers in the historiography of the Holocaust is also, I would argue, somewhat the reverse of how Pisanti depicts it, because the history of the Holocaust was largely written by German scholars and those who eschewed victims' accounts and based themselves on the documents of the perpetrators, namely the Germans, who, as we may remember, lost the war against their enemies' armies. The only war they won was the war against the Jews. The presentation of testimonies it's largely telling the same story that Pisanti also argues. She writes on um, page 87 that the more they are, the more they are alike, is not supported by the actual use of testimonies, at least the hundreds of testimonies that I used uh, when I wrote my, my, my last book, uh, A Microhistory of the Holocaust. And if there are similarities in such accounts, in such testimonies, and these are all testimonies, interviews, videotaped, written, and so forth, um, taken over a long period of time from the time of the Holocaust until the late 1990s or even 2000s, if there are similarities in these accounts, these similarities have to do with the experiences that those people recount rather than the effects of post-war exposure to other narratives about the Holocaust, or at least much more so. And many of these accounts, these testimonies, tell us as historians things that we would, things that we would otherwise not know at all, or only know through the perspective of the perpetrator's documents. Um, so I think it's important to uh, bring that into the discussion. Um, Pisanti, writes that an unconditional mandate accorded to the witness uh, undermines the authority of the historian. Uh, and that um, it, it focuses on, I'm, I'm quoting, a summation of irreducible experiences in which each one is as good as the next, with the result that they all resemble one another. And I, I frankly don't recognize that in the historiography, with the exception, of course, if you look at uh, quasi-documentary accounts, bad films and forgeries, yes, of course it's there, but um, perhaps that's not the only place where we should look. Um, I would say that um, Pisanti's presentation of the use of testimonies in historical accounts, um, to me, uh, frankly, appears a bit uh, naive in terms of her understanding of the historian's craft. Testimonies can and have been integrated into historical reconstructions in a critical manner, along with all other available documents. No historian, not even Jan Gross, who made strong claims about testimonies, has ever argued 
that they have an absolute truth value, uh, which obviously they don't. At the same time, not using testimonies in historiography has had a clearly detrimental effect on the reconstruction of the Holocaust. Um, and we can see that much better now than we did 20, 30 years ago, uh, when there was even greater reluctance by mainstream influential uh, historians, guardians of the historian's craft uh, who uh, eschewed the use of testimonies. Now, I'll just say a couple of more words on, uh, on what I would call sanctity. So Pisanti uh, mentions such people as Elie Wiesel, I would add to that uh, Yechiel Dinur, uh, Katsetnik, um, and uh, of course also Landsman as a sort of the guardians of the memory of the Shoah. My, my, my own sense is that their view of the revelation of mystery in the Holocaust or the other planet, the ultimate mystery, is not at all representative of testimonies. Uh, if he says text, as we know, Knight is strongly existentialist and theological, influenced by Mouriac, and Vinoz is quite unique and filled with contradictions. And both te the texts actually precede the era of the witness, um, written before that. And in that sense, they are their own genre, and they're the opposite pole, of course, of such texts of the time as Primo Levi, Is This a Man, and Jeanne Marie's At the Mind's Limits. Uh, Wiesel is very easy to ridicule um, and, and, and condemn and has been unevenly received in different places. So he's, for instance, um, quite disliked in Israel, popularized in the US, was at least adored in France and is totally ignored in Russia and Poland. Uh, so it, he, as a guardian, he's not a particularly effective guardian, I would say. And um, since, since I'm running out of time, I'll just um, touch on the last thing, which is the connections to the new nationalism. Um, so Pisati speaks of, of a prevalently narrative truth regime based on the dogma of, wit of witness infallibility <clears throat> of those who have blind faith in the narrator to whom they've delegated the quasi divinatory capacity to tell the truth and the guardians, and she tries to connect it to those who, with greater historical coherence, use it to promote their own interests by any means necessary, America first, Italy for Italians, Hungary for Hungarians, and so forth. I would say that um, historically, victimizers um, have seen themselves as victims of those they victimize obviously long before the Holocaust. In fact, that is the kind of a, the core of um, um, Nazi ideology, if, if you take it to that place of, of, of anti-Semitism, if you wanna go there, uh, that is we do to them what otherwise they would do to us or, and have done to us already. Um, so this is in many ways the, the main engine of victimization. Um, and it's most prominently um, uh, displayed in Eastern Europe uh, where the old stereotypes have reemerged, even though the Holocaust narrative never became predominant in the first place and was always in competition, first with the communist anti-fascist story that covered up the fate of the Jews, and then since the 1990s with the narrative of national victimization by communists slash Jews. So in that sense, I think, again, we have a much larger context within which to think about it I would say more about uh, Germany and Israel, but I'll leave that uh, for the discussion later on. So thank you. Thank you very much, Homer. Um, I think if you don't mind, I'd like to chip in for um, just a, a small comment from the point of view of someone who has been in part of the institutions of the Guardians of Memory for I think most of my life, my adult life. Um, and what I find uh, especially cogent to, to, in, in Valentina's book is the reference to what institutions have enhanced. The question of the centrality of witnesses and the question of the intrinsic nationalism that runs the international politics of memory 
where we, we, you know, what we witness is public relations or well, who killed the fewer Jews, who was worse, or who uh, gets more awards that has very much become an element of institutional life and over 30 years has only grown to a degree that we saw less than a year ago, less than a year and a half ago when the main uh, uh, representative of Holocaust research in the United States, the, the Holocaust Museum in Washington has made itself herald against um, the, use, the use of basic principles of historical inquiry. So I'm not sure that, I, I think that in this picture, historians have been relatively um, silent and relatively um, you know, on the margins, except for those who have actually taken the, ridden the, the wave of institutional success. And I think that if we look at issues that we, we see today as institutions, I mean, the use of, of um, testimony to uh, propel uh, historical falsity, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe because I deal with Italy, is a staple of the Italian, the, the Italian narrative and also the Italian narrative abroad on the Holocaust, staple that is largely uh, corroborated by supported by institutions that are very respectable and that, you know, on one side um, support research like the Holocaust Museum or Yad Vashem, but on the other side are um, part in a political game. And I think that when we, uh, I, I, what I read in the, in the, in the book, from the perspective, not of an historian, but of someone who has, has been part of institutional life is, is more in that, in that direction. And I, I think, Manuela, do you? Can, uh, Valentina wanted to speak about testimony, but then I wanted to, to follow up with what Omer said as well. So I'm say, waiting for Valentina. No, no, okay, thank you. I'll just, I, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for, for, your, for your remarks, even for the criticism, especially uh, uh, Omer, Omer's criticism. But before I start, and I won't be able to answer every single issue, every single question, but I'll try to do my best to put them together. I'd like to clear a possible misunderstanding. And I would really like, I really hope that it's not, you know, due to the way the book was written. For me, it was quite clear that I wasn't never referring to uh, the historian's craft. My criticism was never against the way, toward, directed at the way historians work with their sources. It has nothing to do with that. My, my, the whole thing was about the way uh, memory culture is being used within public discourse through the institutions and not just that, through, the, through show business, and through the, the way it's been instrumentalized by just about everybody, but not by historians, because actually I have a feeling I am a public defender of the historian's craft. Uh, and, and, uh, and I can do that because I'm not a historian. I can, I can defend them without giving the impression that I am you know, talking about my own category. Uh, so uh, whenever I discuss the issue of the way testimonies are being used within public discourse, I always make a distinction between the, that use and the, his, and the historiographic use of testimony. Uh, I, I, and uh, for example, you know, when I say the more they are, the more they look alike, obviously I don't mean from a historian's point of view, I mean from the point of view of those people who are eager to comply with the duty of memory and every year they go to listen to the various uh, witnesses who feel almost obliged to repeat the same story over and over again because this is what the students and the teachers and whoever else expects them to do. And because there is a kind of standard format that has been popularized through various channels, including the databases, the huge databases that have been built in the last few years, then, it, then it, it obviously conditions the way 
people talk about their own experience when they're when they're um, talking to a wide audience. It's very different when they're when when historians ask specific questions to those same witnesses, and they might find that they find things out. But historians are very much aware of the fact that uh, we, the witness accounts are uh, sources that have to be treated cautiously. They know what to do with them. They know, for example, that they are obviously written, possibly written with, with mistakes or with false perceptions or with various biases that inevitably occur, especially when uh, many years have gone by and cultural um, interferences have come in the way. And that's why, why they apply uh, standards and caution in dealing with their sources. And they feel that they have to check and cross check their documents, the, 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 those testimonies with other documents, which is the normal procedure within any kind of uh, historiographic research or inquiry, which doesn't mean, of course, that you have to discard testimony that, that has proved wrong in some way or not completely exact. Because as Mark Bloch used to say, even, uh, even false perceptions and false recollections may be very important sources to study, but you have to be clear uh, as to what you're searching for when you are listening to uh, false accounts. Uh, and you have to know what the context you, that, that you're building upon is. So no, I, 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 I feel like I understand what, what, what Omar Bartok is saying, but I don't feel that it really very much applies to what I was trying to do in this book, because obviously, uh, I, I, and the other, and the other, um, the other issue as well, the fact that I don't talk enough about uh, the, the other baddies, you know, the real baddies. Uh, um, well, I, I wasn't trying to do that. I thought that I've done it in other things that I've written. I've worked on racist discourse and on, as I said, on Holocaust denial and on other forms of uh, ultra nationalist discourse. But this time, what I wanted to do is, was to look at ourselves in the mirror. And so the criticism was aimed precisely at us, i.e. liberal democracies who feel that they've paid their duty towards uh, the values that they proclaim as the sacred values of tolerance and whatever, just through the rituals of memory. I feel that, that not only it's not enough, but very often this kind of backfires and, and the various ways in which this may backfire is precisely the, the, the argument, the subject of my, of my book. So I don't know if I've answered. Can I, can I just jump, jump in for, for one minute uh, on, on this issue? Because I think it's important. I'm, I'm, I'm aware that, that you are um, making a difference between the use of testimony in a kind of public institutional sphere and by historians. But I think there's, there's two kinds of slippage here. One is that historians have started using testimony as historical documents only very recently. And one reason that they've done that is because of the use of testimonies also in a public sphere. Historians themselves don't live in a cocoon. They also are, are influenced. This was not done before. And the historical guild, the Tsumpf, was very much against it against using testimonies. Um, uh, Raoul Hilberg was a particularly strong opponent of that. Um, and, and, and German historians made very strong criticisms of the use of these kind of uh, lacrimonious uh, testimonies. They, they, they didn't find them to be scientific. So historians changed also because the public sphere changed. That's, that's one thing that, uh, um, th that is important to understand. Uh, the second is that I think um, you, you have a certain view of, of historians that is uh, a little bit sort of from the outside. That is, uh, sure, historians ask all kinds of critical questions of testimonies, but they're also influenced by working with testimonies, their actual work the nature of their work, the nature of what they write is influenced by this contact with voices from the period, which are not the common voices that they were exposed to before 
these were the documentary voices. And there is no reason in the world to think that uh, documents uh, issued by the Wehrmacht, by the Gestapo, by the SS are objective. None of these voices were objective. None of them were trying to tell the truth. They were all providing their own perspective, what they saw or what they thought other people wanted them to report. And so historians, when they use the kind of different types of materials are influenced by them, their perspective changes. And they have not done that before. This is quite new. And so I think we need to bring that into the discussion because at times when you're writing about testimonies, you are generalizing in ways that are, um, that are working, for me at least, in exactly the opposite direction of what I would like historians to work. That is to work more with the tens of thousands of testimonies of people who wanted to leave a, 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 an account of what happened to them to be used by historians. They did that for historians and were not taken up. That historians for decades betrayed them and never used their material because it didn't fit their own criteria rather than historians changing their criteria and actually using uh, those testimonies to write a more truthful history of the event. But I, okay, thank you. This this makes it clearer in a way. But um, again, uh, there is no reference, I think, in my book, or at least in the way I think, uh, to the fact that historians should not use great masses of testimony uh, for their research. I feel that as long as people know what to do with, with those sources, and yes, I agree with the fact that probably at the beginning, when it was a when 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 the era of the witness began, as it were, uh, it was probably uh, a stimulus even for historians to go and look where they hadn't been looking before, and not just official sources, but and I am a strong believer, for example, in the in the. the um, Merits. I don't know whether the word is right of of oral history and and whatever. But what I am arguing against is the attitude with which non-historians uh, are dealing with testimonies these days. For example, the uh, exactly that. The, the, what happens when the delicate balance between memory and history tilts too drastically in favor of memory within public discourse? Uh, when, when there is a widespread belief in the fact that the witness's authority is unquestionable for the simple fact that the witness it was somebody who was there, uh, uh, who suffered the traumatic experience, who was present at the time. And that means that they are untouchable. And, and please make this, I would like to make this clear too, given that, uh, that it's very easy to, to misunderstand. I never... Uh, have anything against single witnesses or the witnesses as such. But again, it's a question of the way we talk about them. And for example, take the... the, the uh, Valentini. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Go, ahead, go ahead, make an example and then we... we because yeah. I, I think... No, we no, are, I, have, I, I want to, to say something. We're narrowing down on something that... Yes, we exactly. Really we are, this is not about the historiographical question of the use of, of not use of testimony. This is the, the we're talking, we're discussing why something like uh, someone, Schindler, someone like Schindler has become a symbol of, I would say, a, a strongly revisionist form of ethics. Uh, in, in on the base of a use of witnesses that neither uh, Moshe Landau or Yer Hashem would have ever ever approved, nor most historian, I think so. So we're talking about another level. Like, this is not about, you know, strictly the, the way may historians. I some, may I say something? Yeah. On, I mean, I think that this discussion that we are having is complementary. When I start to read the book, when I was asked, and if you remember where we met briefly last time, I mean, if you look at with the eyes of an historian and you want to analyze the, the lack of context in the book, it, it exists. But I think that what you meant to do was not 
working in, in from this perspective. You really wanted to to make a kind of you know a, not general statement, a generic statement, but rather offering a, a zoom view and say, okay, we are in the 2020, 2021 century, and uh, what we have in this moment is this. Of course, that uh, uh, what Omer says uh, is true. It's also true to say that not all the historian use testimony in the way that they should be used. I mean, these institutions that we are talking about, they don't ask to a historian of art. When I was talking before about the guarantee of history, I was really referring to the 2018, uh, the, the Israeli government and the Polish government that thanks or oh, thanks, they asked to an historian they did not ask, they did not close down their things between themselves. The problem is that historians became as a sort of speaker of something that um, is nothing to do with truth. So it's not, we are not discussing with Valentina books if the way in which the testimony is truly in this way, when it is, is really a semiologist approach. That is not the approach of an historian and looking at the things. And in fact, unfolding the discourse, so deconstructing the discourse is important. And as I said before, that was my, you know, that it was missing a part for an historian. That is to say, but there is something that is actually happened. I think that you are asking a more general question of what happened in spite of having produced an enormous memory of the event that has been characterized as the paradigmatic event for the West. And also for the others that didn't want to take it as his own event. And, and this question is an appropriate question because not all the historians are good historians, we must agree on that. And there are bad historians that use very badly testimony. And they do not use them in order to understand or to, uh, to analyze, to, to make, to give a, a larger picture of what happened, you know, to bring sources together. In, in not in terms of objectivity, but in terms of re, re, reprocessing, if you want, historical knowledge. How many books has been written by historian and they were very bad books on witnessing? And th this is a, is a question, it's not uh, something that, uh, sorry. I'm not sure what we're talking about. I mean, this just, it just seems like we're very far from what Valentina's book is actually about as other people have been commenting. It's not a book about historians. It's a book about the public memory of, and public memory cultures of the Holocaust. That's a different question. I mean, historians can ask themselves, maybe should ask themselves what their role in either promoting or criticizing this memory culture is. I think that's a, a good question. That doesn't seem like it's the focus of the book. Um, I wonder if we can get back to, I wonder if we can get back to some of the central questions. And one of the questions that's coming up in the chat, I see it from Mariana Hirsch, for example, is, is really about this question of the, of the strong, and seemingly causal link that you're making between the rise of this particular memory paradigm, right, and this rightward turn in global politics. And I, I think people want to hear more about how you make that case. Uh, and, and if so, maybe you could say a little bit more about, about uh, uh, how you correlate those two phenomena. Well, this is, uh, I can understand the question. Uh, and I can understand the doubts that you, that the statement without a, an argument around it may may, may raise. Um, obviously, I'm not saying that it's exclusively uh, the responsibility, the fault, if you want, of the memory culture, the fact that, 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 that the xenophobic right has uh, risen again. I can't, I, obviously, the, the reasons for this are many and they can't be just reduced to the shortcomings of memory culture. All I am saying is that memory culture has, but in a way belongs to the same cultural context. It 
takes part in the same cultural mechanisms and has possibly inadvertently, because I'm quite uh, prepared to, to accept that very often the mistakes were made in perfectly good faith, but, but takes part in that same authoritarian term, which is also the common denominator with some of the, uh, the most obvious uh, xenophobic drifts that we are uh, worrying about these days. And at the heart of it, there is the idea that a certain category of people, for whatever reason, is right, uh, tells the truth, is, is uh, because, not because they can prove or because somebody else can prove, but because their, uh, their word, their speech acts belong to a different uh, level altogether. There is a kind of different truth regime that is applied to the interpretation of witness testimonies. And the, and the very idea, this is the thing that I was wrestling with in the chapter on, uh, on, on witness testimony, the very idea that uh, there is some kind of uh, uh, truth value that derives from the fact of having experienced something, which of course, I'm not saying that, uh, let me be clear about this. I'm not saying that having experienced something isn't you know, some, something that can be or should be communicated in the, in the way, the channels that it normally is. What I'm saying is that when other people uh, take on the words of the witnesses, and then they say that they can, you know, so speaking on behalf of those victims, of those witnesses, and because of a certain kind of osmotic process, they are receiving the same infallibility that people are prepared to, uh, to, to grant the witnesses. Well, this is where the problem begins because a, 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 a method of authority uh, takes the place, replaces a scientifically minded method to determine what is right and what is wrong, not just in reconstructing the dynamics of the events that you're talking about, but also in interpreting, in interpreting those events and in deciding what kind of lessons you can draw from them, which also mm, leads to deciding who else can talk about those events and transfer those same lessons onto their own situation. So I had the feeling that there was some kind of continuity that I tried to, um, as it were, reconstruct through the various paths. And they're not always obvious paths. I think that your concept of implication, for example, is very useful in this case as well, because there is a form of kind of network of responsibilities that is not so direct. So no, there isn't a direct cause and effect uh, link. But there are many um, a, a familiar air and certain rhetorics and certain ways of going about problems. And I feel that this is how it happened. As I was saying, this is most evident in the case of memory loss, because this is where the, the paradox really explodes. Uh, and it's the, the paradox, there are many paradoxes involved. The paradox between a particular unilateral subjective uh, experience, which is all that you can have with memory. Memory has to be unilateral, subjective, uh, uh, and whatever, that is transformed into a universal uh, narrative that's, you know, good for all uses. And that is one of the paradoxes. And in that paradox, I think that in the folds of that paradox, I think that the right-wing movements and parties thrive because they, it's very easy for them to identify uh, or to appropriate those categories and retell their story using the, the dominant paradigm. But that's not the only one, because as I was saying, for example, the idea of using something which is private, which is particular, such as memory, to as a vehicle for universal values, has to uh, inevitably lead to all sorts of contradictions including the idea that we can never challenge not just the reconstruction, but also the interpretation of a, of, of a witness such as Elie Wiesel, for example, when he says that the Holocaust is a metaphysical, meta-historic experience and that only who, those who were there can talk about it, have a right to talk about it. 
And then you have Claude Lanzmann who says just about the same thing, but for some reason uh, squabbles with Elie Wiesel about who among the two has more right to. And you realize that then because all this happens outside the perimeter of a scientific debate, where usually you, you may decide who is right and who is wrong according to you, but also according to a set of principles that the whole community shares and has given itself as rules of the game. Once the rules of the game don't count anymore because it's just a question of who has more authority to take the floor, to take the word and to tell others to shut up, then this means that you know, you're know you kind of growing the seeds of some kind of authoritarian drift which may also turn right wing as, ha as has happened. But obviously I'm not saying it's just the fault of uh, this kind of culture. This cult kind of culture has participated in the same kind of uh, arena as it were. According to Perhaps a, 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 an appropriate question here would be, are there other examples besides the Holocaust? in which the clash between memory and history and the clash between um, authoritarian means and the pretense of uh, protecting uh, democratic values have come to a short circuit. Are there other examples of past events that have played a similar, a similar role? I have the feeling that since the Holocaust has become the master narrative, then all other memories have kind of adapted to that framework. So the problems that I'm discussing here are really- uh, Michael? Yeah. <clears throat> Is there, Michael wants to speak? No, no, I was just nodding my head, just listening. I'm just listening. Okay, okay. okay. So no, no, I was saying that possibly, yes, possibly in many other cases, for example, in Italy, all the debate about uh, fascist memory kind of repeats the same kind of mechanisms on a, on a popular level, not in, among specialists I'm talking then about, but also because in Italy, and, and to go back to what Michael was saying at, at the beginning, uh, you were talking about the, the, the perverse effects of, uh, of this master narrative that prevents uh, Germans from or other countries, other collaborators to acknowledge their participation in some way. Well, and you, you forgot to quote Italy among the <laughs> culprits among those countries. And they, they, they kind of use, use the Holocaust memory as a kind of screen memory, not to talk about their own implication in those same crimes. So, uh, and, 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 the, and, and that's the reason why the right wing in Italy, for example, is, you know, as long as these leaders can go to, as I was saying, to the various memorial or trauma sites to pay their dues, then they can come back to Italy and recycle old bits of uh, fascist rhetoric. And nobody can tell, tell them anything because at this point, I mean, nobody can accuse them of being, uh, uh, implicated in those very historically implicated and presently implicated in those same uh, phenomena. So I suppose that the mechanisms that I'm talking about here are probably uh, applicable to other cases, uh, other examples as well. I know the Italian situation much better and I know possibly a bit of the French uh, memory, French memory culture. Um, mm, I'd be very interested to know whether these things that I'm saying have any resonance for you in the United States, for example, in, in a different context uh, altogether. But I feel that there is something, you know, um, there is something in common. And that is because a memory culture, Holocaust memory culture, that master nar narrative is global. Uh, or at least Western, uh, as it were. So because it was kind of born in a way, it was born more than in Italy, it, uh, more than in Europe, it was born in America and then transplanted uh, into back into Europe. I feel that some of the things that I am saying probably hold good in, uh, in other contexts as well, including the American one. But one of the reasons why I was interested in this dialogue was to find out whether it actually 
works for you too. Okay, I think we're getting close to wrapping up. There are many questions that uh, we may want to send. Some are very uh, quite extensive and maybe we'll send them to the panelists and you'll be able to answer privately. And I wonder if which one of you would like to uh, make a final comment. Uh, we start maybe with Omer. Um, yeah, thanks. And um, just, a, just a quick comment on the last question. I think that uh, when we talk about memory laws, uh, of which there are many now, um, there are the kind of memory laws that uh, Pisanti uh, talks about, of course, and that's uh, uh, against uh, negation. Uh, there are memory laws that are about uh, national memory, um, that are really to, uh, there to preserve a sense a, of a collective national memory. So you have now memory laws in Poland, you have memory laws in Ukraine, which are actually responding to each other. And you have memory laws in Israel, uh, which are also uh, bear some resemblance to memory laws in uh, Poland and Ukraine. And all of those are really to preserve a national memory of victimhood. Um, th that is, the, they, they are trying to frame that. Uh, now, it, it arguably has to do also, as I think uh, Pisanti is, is trying to say, um, to the way the Holocaust has sort of taken over as a supposedly a collective um, responsibility, a memory of, of collective responsibility. And therefore one can also apply it to one's own uh, national context. But I would say that uh, these kind of national memories of collective national memory uh, is really a product of the 19th century. They, they, they go way back before. And while they may be provided with some extra fuel in this kind of competition over victimhood, say in, in, in Poland and in Ukraine, both one against the other and concerning the fate of the Jews in both countries, they go back and you can easily find it to pre-World War I. Um, and, and so again, I mean, the, the connection between the two main axes or two main questions in the book, I think it's suggestive, but I'm not sure that the case is, is sufficiently made. I could say a word before we go. Um, I mean, I think I think Omer is right that of course there's a larger there's a larger context here and a lar and a longer history, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there that we're not also in a particular conjuncture. And I guess I do agree that we are in a particular conjuncture, even if I would not make and now Valentina says also not really making a strong kind of causal uh, a, a claim, but it's more about correlation and a certain kind of participation in a network of discourses. And I guess I, th I think there is something going on. And I guess I'm very, I think you, you asked Valentina about other contexts in the US. I think in the US, maybe the authoritarian memory culture part plays out a bit differently because I do think we have a, a stronger kind of culture of free speech here. Um, which makes us more suspicious of limiting even some of the more noxious right expressions uh, um, in the public sphere than in places like Germany, uh, France, maybe Italy. So I do think maybe the US in that sense is a little bit different though. In other ways, I think it fits well into what you're talking about. I guess I'm very focused in recent times on, on Germany again. And, and again, I do think there's something going on there. I do think there is a kind of, um, authoritarian turn in what, what has been a very admirable memory culture. And it's complicated and delicate. Um, and it has to do with, you know, I think it has to do with the way we constellate the Holocaust, anti-Semitism, other forms of racism, and the Israeli-Palestinian question. And that particular constellation, and it's complicated, I'm not trying to simplify it, but I think it's having indeed very authoritarian, in your words, maybe not the exact word I'd use, effects in the German context about what is sayable and who is able to say it. And um, 
I think it's also, you see some cracks in that regime as well, which I think are good. Um, but I think for the moment, the dominant regime is precisely um, working in the sort of repressive ways that um, your model implies that they might. It's a longer conversation, but I'll just, I'll, I'll, that's what I'll, those are my two cents for the moment. Manuela? I don't have anything to add, actually. I mean, I really think that uh, there are many things to, to discuss. And I, and the question of globalization and ethnicization of the political discourse is not something of now. It's something that is going on from the end of the, uh, of the 90s. That is to say that there is this movement of global culture and the corresponding movement of the other side is really to build a, a, another political discourse that he feels threatened. So I would say that, for example, the same memory that you were mentioning of the fascist, that is also more complex if we were, we were looking at it on the long on the long term. It distinguished between the Jews. Uh, uh, Omer uh, quoted Feltri. He might say these things about the Jews, but he would never say things like that about Israel. There is really a polarized political discussion with the three, the triade, what Michael was mentioning, uh, the conflicts, uh, and there is Europe, and in Europe there is Germany, and there is the United States, and each of these countries, they really develop other kind of national memory. And I think that what I understood or what I, I read after rereading the book is exactly the, the, the attempt to say, just look what is happening. What can we do in order to change the discourse? Because th this discourse is having uh, uh, heavy consequences in cornering dialogue and real discussions, you know, because it's, everything is against or for, against or for, or you are there or you are off on the other side. There is not anymore any possibility of saying something with Biden being accused of to be a post-Zionist, an anti-Zionist, an anti-Semite, or whatever, you know, all these kind of words, even now that we are talking about memory, memory commemoration, and identity politics, they are in relations, but they are not the same things. So memory is one thing and is there, was always there for history. It's not that we are operating out of memory. So is anyway, I want to thank you for, for the for the evening. And I want to thank you, Valentina, Michael, Omer, Natalia, Alessandro, thank you very much for the invitation. And yeah, good luck. Many. Thank you all. We have many other questions. I think um, just to wrap up, uh, we are, I, I agree, I think with that uh, Valentina's book is really a, a photograph, a picture of a situation is in front of our eyes. We may um, think that uh, we, we try to look at its historical context, uh, see how many of these elements have existed in the past, but how strongly this uh, long durée uh, gaze will enable us or disable us uh, from action. Um, I don't know. We, it's, you know, we're here to, know. to see. Um, the Holocaust has a place in our, in our poli political culture, in our identity culture, and in the ways in which uh, the, the new nationalism is functioning that seems to me unique and different from any other event. And perhaps, um, you know, at this point is what, what, I hope that what Valentina book will do is really to provide institutions, uh, institutions that make history public with tools to look at themselves and start thinking, um, is there something that we're enabling and, um, are there, have we gone too far on, on one side to, in the direction of certain uh, strategies? And is there, are there corrective um, remedies that we can take? And I believe that historians play a very strong role 
in, in this process. Um, one of the books, um, I think, uh, positioned that, that the, the public memory culture as delegitimized the function of the functioning of the practice of historical research i think is quite accurate in, in my um, in my view and um, there hasn't been a really strong response of historians besides you know a few cases and the fact that there are many good, good historians who do their work although also some who don't but uh, so i thank you all for participating and um, I hope we will have the opportunity to continue this conversation. For the many people in the audience who um, did feel they did not have their questions answered, we'll try to uh, collect them and maybe distribute them among the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you.